Since the family made superstars out of the Wilkinses in 1974, television schedules have been crammed with what's often called cinema verite. Just some recent examples of the fly on the wall approach include The Duty Men, Culloden, and Flying Squad. In their different ways, they all represent a kind of documentary making that seeks to get as close as possible to the reality of life with a minimum of outside mediation. And there are more on the way. In the spring, we'll be offered the chance to go inside Lewisham Town Hall to watch the murder squad at work and to follow the fortunes of two top rugby clubs. For over a generation, the fly on the wall tradition has dominated the documentary form. But where did it come from? What does Verite really mean? And how is it changing in the hands of younger filmmakers? For The Late Show, Andrea Stewart has been exploring the history of the form that changed the way we look at the world in an attempt to uncover the truth about Verite. Do you want to shut the door? Um, can I first of all say that, as, as usual, we have um, some television cameras with us this evening because um, of what everybody knows about the, the regular um, filming A Year in the Life of Lewisham. There are also some other television cameras in here who are not interested remotely in us. They're interested in the people doing the filming. So just to let you know why there are two lots of television cameras. Um, Initially, when documentaries started to be made, people would use a handheld camera like this, which would wind up, run for 20 seconds, and you can move about and follow things, uh, but you've got no sound. So you've got to put the sound on later. Next development was this, a spin-off from the movie business, Mitchell. This camera, very heavy, put on a tripod, lights either side of it, sit the subject in the middle, now he can speak. But of course, he's very constrained, very constrained. He can't get up, he can't move, he stays there. Right, so, and he becomes an actor. The next development was a, a portable camera. This is it, an oracle. So what they did was they made this camera so that you could run about with it. They chopped the eyepiece off there so that you could, so that you could put, then they cut the top off it to lighten it. And so you had a camera that you could sit, it ran quietly, no noise, and you could record sound, and it ran for 10 minutes. So this revolutionised the documentary film because you could now follow a subject and follow what that subject was doing and record the events. And that was the great, great change. In 1960, a group of filmmakers, including Richard Leacock and Robert Drew, were among the first to make use of this new camera technology. Life magazine commissioned them to develop a filmed equivalent to its renowned photo spreads. The TV journalism at that time was almost totally verbal. It was interview, 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 interview. Smoking cigarettes, interviewing, interviewing. Ed Morrow and all that sort of stuff. They're very splendid, but, but cinematically dead. And Drew said, why can't we do with film what we at Life Magazine do with the little camera, with the Leica? Yeah, the fingers are on just to touch them to just ease you right. Now it's uh, kind of intertwine the fingers a little. There, there. They managed to persuade John Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey to allow them to cover their campaign trail. Right at the beginning, we, we were with Kennedy, and we went into the, in a small town. We went into this photographer's studio. That time is my yeah, my. It was the first time we walked into a situation absolutely cold. We didn't turn any lights on. We didn't ask. We didn't no interviews, no nothing. We just filmed what was happening in front of us, and it's a dumb scene. What political significance does having a portrait take? But it's a wonderful scene. Here was an opportunity to shoot sync um, in an, in an insta instantaneous way. 
which had never been possible. If you look at the documentaries of the 30s, which have sync in them, they were shot like feature films. What those guys did was they hung around um, and they noted words and then they constructed a script and then they went off and shot it. In fact, Night Mail, one of the classic British documentaries of the 30s, the interiors had to be shot on a soundstage at Beaconsfield Studios. Coming over. Bill Foster, Dickens. Coming over. Undergoing, Bill. Any second division. When documentary pioneer Robert Flaherty made Nanook of the North in 1922, his attempts to film real life required enormous preparation. In this scene, Nanook and his family are waking up in a large-scale igloo with no roof, specially built so that there's enough space and light for Flaherty to shoot. Although technical advances were to make filming less arduous, Flaherty's disciples continue to be inspired by his attention to the details of everyday life and his refusal to use commentary to tell the audience what to think. Flaherty was is the key for me. After World War II, coming out unemployed, like legions of other people, wondering what on earth I'd been shooting essentially newsreels all this time, um, I went to see Mr. Flaherty and he, on the spot, hired me to be cameraman on Louisiana Story's last film. And this was 14 months of shooting. I mean shooting every day for 14 months. Every hour of every day. Incredible experience. <laughs> Flaherty's influence can be clearly seen in primary. The camera is in the very center of events, right among the people. Both primary and other documentaries that followed in the 60s were driven by a democratic spirit. They offered audiences a window onto new worlds, but they also encouraged them to judge what they saw for themselves. The belief that what took place in front of the camera could be passed on to the audience, virtually unmediated, was captured by the terms coined for these new films. Terms like direct cinema, cinema verite, or observational documentary. All right, sir, now, now if I can get the Kennedy Committee for me, we can make it unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a cardinal rule, no interviews. Then we extended it. I'm not sure that we were aware of this, but this is what we did. We extended it. Never ask anybody to do anything. Never tell them where to sit. Never tell them to repeat something. If the car's gone with them, forget it. Don't have them stop around the corner and pick you up. Don't do any cheating. We tried to stick to that. The reason we coined the expression observational cinema was to, to define the process, that we were observing things that had some kind of autonomous reality, some autonomous being. We were not controlling it. And everything else was fiction. So if I interview somebody like you're interviewing me now, it's fiction, because we're constructing something. But it, if you put it in the form of a conversation, it's somewhat less constructed. But real movies, fiction movies, are full of conversations too. So we were trying to figure out what the difference was between the two. Why, why worry about a genre called documentary unless it was doing a different job, unless it could reveal different kinds of truths about our lives, our experiences. Some uh, scholars now, younger people, um, are, are saying, oh, you, we couldn't have been so naive as to believe that we were actually watching life unfold. We must have known that, you know, the thing was edited. We must have known that there were uh, biases creeping in inevitably because of the choice of lens and all the other factors, because of the presence of the crew, and so we couldn't have been so naive. I have to tell you my recollection is that we were, that we were that naive, and that we really did believe that we'd got a key to understanding the world. In fact, we'd finally got the key. The camera had been promising us this for 60 years and hadn't delivered, but we'd finally got the key. We were like kids because we thought we were rediscovering cinema. All the stuff that fiction was doing, documentary could not do, and could go with it anywhere at any time. That was really a kind of reinvention, and that gave us an enormous thrill. We had no clue how to do it. The films were endless and boring, and we always missed the main points, and we had to learn all over again what was interesting in front of the camera. Yeah, I mean, that don't make sense running the place at all, all over the place. It really don't. All over the city, all these hours, 
three and four hours at a time. In the mid-60s, one of the major proponents of the new cinema was the American Frederick Wiseman, who abandoned his legal career to undertake a series of studies of the thorny relationship between individuals and institutions. But it don't make sense. His work was profoundly influential on a generation of students who attended the new National Film School in the 70s. Might have to wind up coming back up here. That's what happened. I like Wiseman's work a lot, and um, I see Penny Baker, Lee Cox. I was always really interested at the beginning in the way in which you have an interrogation or you have an interview, and the way in which you go from point A to point B. And it seemed to me that film could record that in a way that nothing else could. After leaving film school, Nick Broomfield made a study of the police juvenile liaison department in Blackburn with Joan Churchill, who shot this scene. Well, there's loads of times I've seen kids that be, you don't go around, oh, I bet, I bet he's knocking stuff off, I bet he's knocking oh, I stuff off, I bet he's knocking I stuff off. So it was a very highly pitched situation. People were being caught and confronted in front of their parents, or sometimes it was traumatic for the parents. And in a way, film could capture that, and it was very long takes. And what most fascinated us was the way in which things developed within a particular take. So it was kind of pure in that way, which was, we didn't use cutaways, and it was, you know, a, an attempt to follow a kind of a process of, of an interview through. This use of film as intense social observation, with a minimum of cuts or embellishments, was soon to find powerful expression on television. We just looked at five examples of communication as we take it for granted. One in the family, one at school, one at work, one in politics, and one in diplomacy. And we took, um, again, quite ordinary examples uh, and studied them, just watched them. And by offering them to the audience with a minimum of introduction, we wanted them to derive their own sense of what was happening, to really to build their own theory of communication by just watching it. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Father's Day. Cheers. Cheers. Mind it? Don't spill it. But don't crush a glass down. Put it down to it. This again seemed quite radical at the time because we weren't telling people what to think, what to feel about it. Uh, there was no expert. And typically, the Radio Times, in promoting this, went off and interviewed a lot of people with pipes and had, and, you know, they got experts into the thing again and we had to tell them it's not about experts it's about your life you know there's no question that when observational cinema reached british television in the 70s it was a real revelation um, it arrived in britain a kind of a decade after it had arrived in america partly as a result i think of just the natural insularity of uh, of british television institutions um, but when it did arrive, there's no question that uh, it blew apart the, the conventional historical ways of, of doing TV documentaries, which had basically been up until that point uh, variations on, if you like, the lecture film. Grace's image of a family going through the therapeutic process seemed revelatory at the time. I don't know that I can. I want him to help me. Uh, with my greatest problem, which it seems to me to be Colin. We never used lights, never used staging. Um, dressed the way the people in the situation uh, dressed. Uh, hid all the equipment out of sight. Um, kept the minimum number of people in the room. I mean, this sounds ludicrous, but I would actually... I mean, we made an absolute rule never to look anyone in the eye. And I hope that that kind of effort to minimize the effect of our presence really meant that what we watched in the end was what might have happened, more or less, if we hadn't been there. Documentaries that looked as if the filmmaker hadn't been there, which outlawed interviews, commentary, and any hint of the camera's presence, soon became the orthodoxy. Their appeal owed much to British television's enshrined tradition of neutrality. 
There was that period when the Green Book of Principles of Documentary was published by the BBC for its documentary units, where it was stated quite clearly that documentary filmmakers were not allowed to have a point of view. That was for the drama department. So, in one sense, observational film is a response to that. How can I get the subjects that I think are burning issues onto television uh, and still stay within that, that code? And I think observational cinema allows that because you are saying what you think is important by who you give airtime to. All television says that. And this is a way of doing it with as little mediation as possible. Nowhere was this seen more clearly than in Roger Graves' series Police, which combined the apparent objectivity of direct cinema with coverage of a vital contemporary issue. Out of the way, and they just—I uh, didn't notice the bloke behind me, and uh, he grabbed me from grabbed one arm, and the other one went and grabbed the other arm. So he grabbed you in the car park. And not Thames Valley Police gave Graves unique access, and the resulting films, in particular *Complaint of Rape*, led to widespread public debate and progressive change in police procedure. Graves' non-interventionist approach resulted in what he described as films of record. But the filmmaker was always more than just a recorder. Even Graves' raw-looking footage was subject to the shaping of the editorial process. The very act of editing, I mean, starting to film and then to edit from within that, of course, is a fictionalization or certainly a novelization. That, the wonderful editor, Di Vaughan, who did a lot of work with me, um, to described it as a kind of 19th century novelization of life where because we create beginnings, middles and ends where there aren't any and I think he's right. But what we did in the case of the family film which in a sense may be a, perhaps I'm next to the rape film and the police series the most uh, productive film that we did was we opened up something for the family on camera that they didn't know about themselves so that we accepted and showed everybody and they shared the discovery process that making a film about yourself or having a film made about yourself um, permits. Some of the most memorable scenes of self-revelation came in the other series on the family made by Paul Watson in 1974. I made the family because I didn't think that at that time, people like Margaret Wilkins were getting a fair crack of television. And uh, when I sold it to the head of documentaries at that time, was Richard Corston, he looked at me in a rather odd way and said, well, if you really want to spend your time in an ordinary family, uh, um, I suppose, well, let's see. And no one thought that ordinary family would have that much that would hit the two heads that we have to hit, which is you know, entertaining and interesting. Richard Corston had made his name directing the first Fly on the Wall documentary about the royal family in 1968. A far cry from the kind of images Watson was to bring back from Reading. But Watson's style was also very different from that of his contemporaries. From the very beginning, both the camera and the producer were actively involved in the film. As you can see, we're filming. It is going to be a tremendous intrusion into your privacy because we will film everything and there's no lights so you're not going to be in a position where you think well once they turn the lights off we can talk in secret we can really discuss the things that are necessary to the, making this family work we are here all the time and we can film you at any time anywhere we've all just we've all talked it over we know that that much would be involved so therefore um in for a penny in for a pound we're either going to do it or we're not going to do it a lot of people think of the family as being a pure fly on the wall piece of television. But I think that Paul Watson's material then and Paul Watson's material now uh, is and was very different to the purest Roger Grafe kind of uh, fly on the wall material. I think that uh, Watson was much more interventionist personally uh, in the films. His presence was, was there. Well, what you want is a nice, nice, you know, just ordinary marriage. Right. A nice reception. I don't want an ordinary one. Everybody has ordinary ones. I oh, don't right. want an ordinary one. I just don't want to get married on television. Why? Right? I just don't fancy. Why? The, I just don't fancy the idea. Why don't you fancy the idea? What puts you off the idea? Different people here, camera crews here, and all that. But the camera's here now. Yes, but I'm not getting married now, am I? Secondly, some of the sequences were clearly a little bit preconceived or semi-staged. 
but I think perhaps most importantly, um, the series was transmitted while it was still being shot, so the responses of the viewing public clearly fed back into the behaviour of the Wilkinses. Must have looked see if they've got anything in here about the way and all that. Everybody else seems to have got everything in that. Lust mm -hmm. girls. Ah, I thought that. For Watson, the act of filming becomes part of the story. An approach described by one critic as less fly on the wall, more fly in the soup. The camera's catalyst has its own history. In 1960, the sociologist Edgar Morin proposed to anthropologist Jean Rouge that they make a film looking at the tribe of people living in Paris. This film has not been experienced by men and women. Qui ont donné des moments de leur existence à une expérience nouvelle de cinéma vérité. And this idea to make uh, to consider my concitoyens as uh, people that you can study as you do it in uh, anthropology was a sort of wonderful idea. Tu vois, Morin, uh, l'idée de réunir des gens autour d'une table est une excellente idée. Seulement, je ne sais pas si nous arriverons à enregistrer une conversation aussi normale qu'elle le serait s'il n'y avait pas de caméra. We decided to make a film without any script, without any scenario. The only idea would be uh, what what is your life? The question would be are you happy? Êtes-vous heureux? Monsieur s'il vous plaît, êtes-vous heureux? Je dis qu'est-ce que ça peut vous foutre S'il vous plaît, êtes-vous heureux N'ayez pas peur, on ne veut pas vous faire de mal. Rouge Morin's film is an altogether different kind of documentary. Not a story of what might have happened if the camera hadn't been there, but a story of what happens because the camera is there. Pourquoi vous êtes malheureux, monsieur Parce que je suis trop vieux. C'est vrai Oui, 79 ans. Non. Apparent, si. Je suis 82. <laughs> it was a kind of uh, uh, research in which the human beings, the people we film, were not objects, they were subjects of the film, they were human beings. Rusch's experiment owed much to an earlier filmmaker, Zika Vertov. In the 1920s, he'd produced a series of films which he called Kino Pravda. Perhaps his triumph? His man with a movie camera, a kaleidoscopic view of a summer's day in Leningrad, and a film about the making of a film. As a, an homage to Ziga Vertov, we decided to say in the first image of Chronicle of a Summer that this film was a kind of new experiment of cinema verite. My goodness, uh, that was <laughs> stupid because then all the time the people said, where is the truth? It's impossible to have the truth. The Kino Pravda, the Cinema Verité, is not the film of truth, but the truth of film. This approach to filmmaking which makes overt the business of the film's construction, began to appear in Britain in the 80s. So that when Nick Broomfield and Joan Churchill made a follow-up to Juvenile Liaison, they put themselves and their problems clearly in the picture. The addresses we had were 15 years old. Only one family was still living at the same house. After two weeks of banging on doors, we decided to hire a private detective. She found that everyone was still... I became very hidebound by having to make what's called a cinema rate film. You know, they take ages to make because you're obviously hopping around waiting for things to happen and, you know, often they don't happen when they're supposed to happen. I know and sometimes the associations you make when you're doing a film are so much richer than what you actually come up with and I just wanted to think of a way of putting all these things in. One of the difficult things about making these films is one never really quite knows what's going to happen to the people who are in them when they're finished. And I've often, we've both, Joan and I, thought about you. And if possible, we'd like to, to come and see you. Yeah, it was quite a controversial film in the first place, wasn't it, for the way it was edited and so on. Um, 
I mean, did you feel that the editing in the film was unfair? Yeah. It's just an absolutely intrinsic part of making these films that people get hurt or can get hurt by being a part of them. And what you're doing always is you're going in there and you're looking at a culture and in, in enormous detail and obviously you're going for the probably the more interesting aspects of it. And then you're showing it in a completely different context and obviously that's quite an explosive thing in itself, you know, because people have very strong reactions. And then people, private people become public people. This seemed the ideal time to adopt a more direct approach, though I have to admit to being quite intimidated by him. Yeah. In his last offering, Broomfield exploited the dramatic potential of what normally goes on behind the scenes. His attempts to secure an interview with South African right-winger Eugene Terre Blanche becomes a black comedy of trial and tribulation. Why always when I'm busy with my people, I do not have the opportunity to see them many times. Okay, we're, we're this is the first time in two years that I see them, so please give, give, let, let I take the time to see my people and next week in my office, officially, we'll have you interview. Okay? Okay. The film couldn't be further from Broomfield's earlier work. Here are the cameras anything but anonymous. It's more of an accomplice. I don't think anyone really believes in the notion of objectivity anyway. And in a way, I think by having that pretense and sharing much less with the audience, you, they're much less able to evaluate what you're giving them. Yeah. If Nick Broomfield has moved away from pure fly on the wall, the work of Diane Tams still bears many of its hallmarks. Her recent documentary, Casualties, is about an institution, has no guiding commentary and few edits. But even Diane Tams has become less strict with herself. When I started filming, I was much more, um, if one likes, purist about it. I did not speak to anyone. When I had the camera up, I wouldn't talk. Um, I just sort of was there looking to see how uh, people interacted much m with a much more distant view than I do now. Now I, I'm there, and if people talk to me from behind, and I'll answer them from behind the camera. Is something sticking out of the bean? Sorry? Something sticking out of the bean. Say, say bean, eh? There was a sense when I first started making films that, was that one made as few cuts as possible, that the whole sequence should run, and the longer the sequence would run, that was the better because it was actually um, more true. But I'm, I think the, the truth really is what you actually come away with at the end of seeing the film. I mean, it's your truth that you're seeing, and everybody who makes a film is putting their own truth on, on the screen. They all have their own ways of doing it. They all decide this is acceptable or that isn't acceptable. Some people have captions up, some people have a little bit of commentary. Um, and, and we all have our own ways of trying to tell the audience what's happening. The problems about documentary are not to do with whether you can actually go in and film something. The problems are to do with what you do with it afterwards. Life doesn't come in 30 minute or hour long or 90 minute segments. The whole business of documentary film is to take material shot from life and mold it into stories, right? That's what documentary is. That's what Robert Flaherty did with the first documentary film so, so judged, um, Nanook of the North. He took a lot of random stuff and he made a story out of it. The real issue about documentary films is making stories. This storytelling function is becoming more and more important as documentaries attempt to find in real life some of the energy and incident usually confined to scripted drama. D. 
DEA, a recent series on the US Drug Enforcement Agency, is clearly influenced by the look and style of American TV fictions, using cutting, voiceover and music to heighten the sense of character and place. I wanted to take that sort of verite on a step more and make the films as much as possible round a singular story, structured where possible also round a singular person telling that story, looking for a charismatic duty men type detective to tell that story. And therefore the films were made very much, if you like, in a sort of dramatic way. The undercover is not buying dope or buying guns or buying anything because people do that every day. Undercover is eliciting, implicating statements, and the bottom line is you want to make this guy do what you want him to do without him knowing it. It's my favorite part of the job. The first episode of DEA sets up um, this undercover cop, Eddie, as a kind of classic uh, character who might be played by Dustin Hoffman in a movie, uh, and you've got a very classic narrative uh, where you start out wondering whether he's going to get his guy or not. That makes sense. Either he's the stupidest guy alive or he trusts us, one or the other. Well, at this point, we kind of committed. And it works its way through to a resolution. <laughs> that is shaped very much like a, a Hollywood film. <laughs> and it's a kind of classic example of the way in which observational filmmaking has developed, um, finding strong characters, finding a strong narrative, uh, finding situations that by and large people haven't been in themselves, taking you into a different sort of world. I think what we've seen in British TV over the last two or three years is again another uh, sort of uh, invasion of styles from across the Atlantic, in the same way in the 70s we saw the pure uh, direct cinema styles crossing over into British TV. I think in the late 80s, we've seen the sort of reality TV. So I was looking for a way of weaving in characters and stories through into us. One of the difficulties for us was in trying to not make it like London's Burning. But the problem is, and I think on television, and you have it all the time, is that you can't show little happening. I, I mean, I thought, I really did think very hard about trying to do one program when nothing happened other than regular maintenance work, regular checks, regular visits, um, sitting around having sandwiches, sitting around having coffee, preparing to go to sleep. Really a, a sort of program where absolutely nothing happened. But this is a program which is gonna go out on ITV. Um, ITV want um, high ratings. And watching little happening isn't very exciting. And so I think one of the problems you inevitably face when you're doing a series of this sort is trying to capture the reality, but you're also packaging that reality. In the early days of Verite, just witnessing the minute eye of other people's lives was enough, but now something more seems required. I don't think anyone's surprised now that realism, a sort of realism, can be transferred to the small screen in our homes. I think it's got to be more than that. We've got to do something with it now. And that requires going back to authorship, going back to understanding why you're a filmmaker. The last few years, I've been much more interested in a very heightened realism, in a very expressionist realism. Um, Things like, I think, From Wimps to Warriors, which was going in a direction that was taking as source people uh, and then interpreting with them. I remember one night at the limelight it was, you know, I was writing a dream world. And I had my eyes shut and I was jigging away. And I had this dream that I was at night with all armour and all the flags. Big white holes, and I was gathering through these woods. Others have a more basic complaint against really Verite like that it rarely, it's if really ever, addressed time. itself to the truth of their particular time. experience. Over the last 10 years or so, uh, filmmakers from 
different positions to the mainstream, as it were. Uh, certainly black and Asian filmmakers, perhaps some women filmmakers, perhaps some gay filmmakers, have seen observational filmmaking as in some sense the, the mainstream language, a language which can only present things as they are and not suggest how things might be different. And for those filmmakers, it is very important to suggest how things might be different and indeed what is wrong with things as they are at the moment. And so you've seen uh, work, I mean, a, a notable example is Handsworth Songs, which has elements of, doc of, of observational filmmaking, but places them in a context, a historical context, an analytical context, a political context, and a poetic context to create a statement about black experience in Britain in the 1980s. There are no stories in the riots, only the ghosts of other stories. If you look there, you can see Enoch Powell telling us in 1969 that we don't belong. You can see Malcolm X visiting us in 1965 when the Conservatives said, if you want a nigger for your neighbour, vote Labour. She remembered Malcolm strolling through Smethwick saying, if this is the centre of imperialism, then we have a common struggle. If you spoke to me five years ago, I would have told you exactly where I stood. I don't like flying a war. It's reactionary. It doesn't, doesn't have a way of dealing with black lives. And I think I'll be quite right, because on the whole, it didn't. I mean, I hadn't seen one so far with a black subject that seemed to me to get close to understanding what was going on, you know, in the frames. We need to begin to find ways of marrying the kind of important, you know, implications of having this mo mobility, having this um, freedom to film things with the sort of rigour and the precision that the, you know, pre-war documentaries had. Their understanding of the need for construction, their understanding for the need of the need for ideas, you know, um, of reflection. While Black Audio employ a variety of styles to get at the truths they want to touch on, one of the most successful reworking of the documentary film has come from the simplest source, a single voice produced by one person with a video 8 camera. The tabloid boys wouldn't have been interested in this one. Fans and locals in World Cup good time kickabout. It doesn't sell newspapers, does it? But what went on afterwards, later that night, the comic brigade would have seen as something to really get their teeth into. Video diaries offer their audience many of the things the documentary pioneers sought. Immediacy, directness, all the edginess of a direct encounter. And there was a lot of activity. And I saw tons and tons of troops who apparently had surrounded about 30 people. Um, at gunpoint, our people were completely freaked out. And once again, as in the 60s, it's changing technology that's made possible new ways of representing reality. Three years ago, when I retired, I got one of these little, tiny, ridiculous little cameras. Little, tiny thing. I've got it here, but it's um, video eight. Put a decent microphone on it, and my. God, the things you can get with that. Today, I'm more and more obsessed with detail, with the texture, the feel, the smell of, of how people live, how they interact, how they, the, the delicate things. Next year, we're going to make a feature film, theatrical, with the same equipment, the hell with them. You can make it a, a Girly film, you can make a dance film, you can make an opera, you can make anything with this equipment. I, w I, w I want to make two quotations. First, uh, Ziga Vertov said, what's important is not to make a film, it's to make a film we, and this film give birth to other films. And that's the idea. And the second is uh, what uh, said Robert Wright, he said in the future, the cinema will be 
made by amateur, real amateur, which means people who are in love with what they are doing. Et vous, comme Marcel, ils sont contestés. Alors moi, ça me gêne, ça m'embête. Je croyais que le spectateur allait aimer les personnages que j'aimais. Bon, autrement dit, nous avons voulu faire un film d'amour et on aboutit à une sorte de film d'indifférence. Mais en tout cas, dans lequel, non pas d'indifférence, un film non, de, non, les gens de, de réaction et de réaction qui n'est pas forcément une réaction sympathique. C'est la difficulté de communiquer quelque chose. Nous sommes dans le bain. Oui. 